Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. So we are starting a two-part series on putting an end to self-sabotage today. Anybody up for that? Yeah. All right, good. So if you had to choose, if you had to choose to either eat tacos every day or be skinny, which would you choose, chicken or beef? <laughs> Some of you saw the, uh, uh, the video I did, uh, the promo video, I was over at House of Pies talking about self-sabotage. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, why do we do that? Why is it that when we, we have a goal, there's something we want to experience in our lives, that we, we know the path, we make the, right, the best decisions we can, we start taking those actions that are in alignment with our goal, and at somewhere, some point, we choose the taco, <laughs> or the pie, or the cigarette, or the bad relationship, or we, we choose fear, we become, you know, because for me, it's often my self-sabotaging behavior has been either through action or inaction. That's a big one for me, too. So we're going to explore this for two weeks. Um, today, I'm going to tell you why you do it. <laughs> and next week, you got to come back now, because next week, I'm going to tell you how to stop doing it. So... <laughs> So, not exactly, but sort of. So we're going to begin with a reminder of who and what we are. In unity, we actually are not a dualistic faith tradition. We do not believe that God created, um, created all that there is and then somehow separated um, his, her energy from it. That God is present, that we are all expressions of the one life. When Jesus said people talk about the kingdom, that, that lo, it's here, lo, it's there, but no, it is within. That's what we're talking about. Ernest Holmes is a great uh, founder of New Thought. He, he um, wrote the book, Science of Mind, which then spawned a whole movement. It's our sister denomination called the Centers for Spiritual Living. And this is from his book, Living the Science of Mind, which began as a, a correspondence course. But he writes this. Our divine inheritance is self-sufficiency, perfection, peace, wholeness. And this must include abundance, self-expression, accomplishment and happiness. The nature of God is wholeness. The nature of wholeness is happiness. The nature of happiness is peace. The nature of peace is harmony. And the nature of harmony is joy. So whichever way we turn the proposition, we are compelled to understand that the nature of reality, the nature of God, is perfect. Therefore, the will of God must always be a will towards our wholeness, peace, poise, power, and self-expression. Can I get an amen? amen? That's it. Let's go home. I think we got it. That the fundamental wholeness of God, of the universe, of spirit, of the divine, infinite, creative mind is everywhere present. And we are expressions of that perfection. That we are whole, perfect, and complete, just as we are. So why the tacos? Well, we have other inheritances as well. 
That's our divine inheritance, Ernest Holmes talked about. We have a biological inheritance as Homo sapiens, that our species evolved in times of uh, when food was scarce. I know you find this hard to believe, but there was a time when you couldn't just pick up your phone and have food come to your front door. <laughs> there were times uh, we, our ancestors came from the continent of Africa, and there, were, there on the savanna, we, we developed some of the, uh, the skills and the, the traits that we still carry. And it was a tough time to be Homo sapiens. And there, uh, the famines would come the predators were there, the other tribes may be attacking, and there would often be a time for the, the tribe to have to pick up and move. And in those times, it was very stressful, and we burned a lot of calories getting where we needed to go. And so those who could find the high-calorie foods and then store those calories <laughs> were equipped for survival. And guess what? Those are all of our ancestors. The skinny ones died out. <laughs> and so, even though we are no longer being chased by lions on the savanna of Africa, when we are stressed, we reach for the high calorie, the salty, the sweet, and the fatty foods, which are now available everywhere, <laughs> easily cheaply. And so this is a self-sabotage problem that you didn't create. There's nothing wrong with you. You didn't make this system. You have been born into a human uh, genealogy that carries this, this trait that when we are stressed as a species, we reach for sweetie. Sweet. <laughs> so, well, sometimes we do that too. <laughs> come here. Come here, sweetie. <laughs> But we reach for those sweet, salty, and fatty foods because it comforts us. Something is wired into our DNA that we know that that's what we need, but it's not what we need. Our evolutionary adaptive traits are not a match for our current environment. One of the reasons for self-sabotage. Another is that we inherit family systems. Yeah, somebody knows. <laughs> In Exodus 25, God says, I will visit the sins of the fathers upon the sons, even to the third and the fourth generation. The metaphysical understanding of that is this. Things that happen, trauma, in an earlier time in the family get transmitted unconsciously and non-verbally, sometimes verbally. They're going to get you. You got to play safe. Money is scarce. Don't turn your back on them. Those kinds of things, they get transmitted in family systems. There are unconscious family loyalties. You're going to be hearing, uh, uh, my partner John Moore does this work on family constellations, and it's really powerful work about how to uncover those systems that are ingrained in the psyche, not just of me and my experience and me and my bi biology, but in my family of origin. And we carry it generation to generation. So many times when we would seek to step into a new way of our divine inheritance of peace, poise, power, freedom, and abundance, something else comes in and another choice is made. And we feel sometimes like it's conscious. Susan Pierce Thompson, she wrote the book Bright Line Eating, which is a brain science a, a, approach to food addiction. And she writes this, Consciousness is not a unitary phenomenon in the brain. Different parts of the brain create their own consciousness, but to us they all sound like me. This is where the inner conflict comes from. Even though incredibly primitive parts of our brain talk to us in our mind with our own voice when they need... I'm sorry, let me try that again. Um, even incredibly primitive parts of our brain talk to us in our mind with our own voice when they need to direct our behavior. They reason with us and they win. We think we've chosen a behavior and decided to take certain action, but that's an illusion. She says, if you want to test this theory, make a decision in your conscious mind, pre prefrontal cortex, to hold your breath for three minutes. <laughs> At some point, you will 
decide to take a breath. And you will think, well, this was dumb anyway. Why did he tell me to do that? I don't want to do this. Your mind, the, the identity that, is, that you think of as the self, makes a decision. But you know what? It wasn't that at all. It was actually the brain stem right back here, the oldest part of the human nervous system, the brain. And its whole purpose is keeping you breathing and alive. And it made the decision for you. And you think it was you. There are whole strands of consciousness coming through us and to us, and we are making decisions that we think are conscious. But it's, it's great-great-grandma. It's our ancient ancestor in Africa. It's the, even the reptilian brain that we carry making decisions for us, and we think we're in charge. We definitely don't want to go home at this point, do we? This is like kind of depressing. So how do we even begin to work with it? If we have all these different ideas, well, this is why I'm so grateful. I'm a truth student of unity teachings because there is one voice in me that knows the truth. That still, small voice that knows who I am as a son of God as an expression of the divine's desire to know itself as Michael God. And here I am, God. And that voice knows the truth. We get in touch with it. We might call it the observer. When we're doing our meditation practice, we let the thoughts go. We let all those impulses from other systems go, and we get this place that is observing the thinking happening, our truer self, the spiritual self, the higher self, I do not know why this is the game that we signed up for. I don't know why we have elected to incarnate into this biological, family-driven system where we have these other voices that get in the way of what we want, that get in the way of our truth. But here's what I do know. It's perfect. And your problems are perfect for you. It's true. It's true. When we did our, our, our series on transformation a few weeks ago, we kept going back to the butterfly, the butterfly, that idea that the caterpillar doesn't look anything, doesn't even have the right structures in place to be what it's called to be. And something I think we touched on was that if you break open the chrysalis to let the butterfly out earlier, it will die. It needs the process of breaking through the shell to let the blood go through the veins into the wings and causes it, that allows it to be. And you are the same way. And maybe in other timelines and universes, you're doing it differently. But here, as a human being, this is the way it works. The very problems that you are experiencing from your family, from your biology, from the culture that we find ourselves born into, these are the very places where the truth is being asked for. And if you're willing, if you're willing to go deep, if you're willing to question your own assumptions, if you're willing to find good teachers, you can reveal the truth. You can bring the light to what looked like nothing but darkness before. And on the other side of that, guess what you find? <sighs> Freedom and fulfillment. So are you ready to do this work with me? It's kind of a low murmur. I don't know. <laughs> I want to speak for a moment about that voice that I have inside me that usually says something like, who are you kidding? You can't do that. You're no good at that. Is, am I the only one? Do you all have that voice? <laughs> only it's in your voice, maybe? This is the inner critic. The inner critic is an aspect of the psyche formed in childhood from messages that we receive that we believe to be true. Bruce Lipton talks about the first six years of life that we are wide open. We receive all the cultural and family messages and we accept them as true. That explains a lot, huh? <laughs> I, for years I was a vocal coach and I would, I would work with people and I was a choir director, as you know, up until last September. And I... Uh, 
I would deal with so many people that felt that they knew that they couldn't sing because they had a third grade teacher tell them, honey, you should just open your mouth but not make any sound. <laughs> so many. I don't know who these third grade teachers were, but they are mean. <laughs> Sometimes I want to gather them around. And say, but we take those messages and we believe them to be true. And you know what yours are. You know what the messages that you heard early on in life and you believe them to be true. I'm here to tell you they are not true. If you can speak, you can sing. Let me tell you about one of mine. About 10, 12 years ago, I was uh, having some conflict with my boss, which is complicated by the fact she's also one of my best friends and my minister. And uh, we're just different, you know, and you people rub, and that's, that's okay. But it, it was, seemed to be increasing in intensity and uh, the t how often it happened. And one day, it was a, it was a tough, tough thing. I, I remember I was just like, oh, what is going on here? And I was, I was scheduled to go on retreat. I went on this retreat for ministerial school. And uh, the dean of our school, who um, was also a wonderful minister and a, a personal mentor to me as well, she, she led us in this process called Fear to Faith created by two Science of Mind ministers on the West Coast, Lloyd Strom and Marcia Sutton. And in this process, what she asked to do was call to mind a current problem, the thing that's just right here. And so I wrote down is this conflict with my boss, my friend. And then we use our imagination in different ways, all these parts of the process. Some of you, I've done in this process with some of you in here. And then, and then we are asked to go back into childhood and find a situation, let a memory come forward that feels like this, has a similar quality about it. And what came forward for me, I've told this story on Wednesday night. I don't think I've ever told it here on Sunday morning before. What came forward for me was a memory from when I was three years old. When I was three years old, my babysitters, Anita and Julie Sains, who lived down the street on the next block, they, I loved those girls. They were in high school, maybe junior high, Julie, and they had, they had given me one of their old baby dolls, and that doll had seen some hard times. Half the hair was pulled out, only one eye opened. I mean, it was... <laughs> And I loved it, loved it. I loved them, they gave it to me. I've always been kind of a nurturer, loved it. So three years old, I'm going to church as a family. I dragged my little doll with me. We're back in the preschool Sunday school class. And then as we did in the Methodist church in Avon, Oklahoma, we all trotted out and we said, we either sang Jesus loved me or we, or we recited a Bible verse and here I am holding my doll. My dad did not think this was a good choice. So we go home. My dad took the doll away. He and my mom argued. There's no son of mine. I just, I'm, I don't remember the actual words, but I remember the energy of it. That I had, I had done something horribly wrong that upset my family. And he said he was going to take the doll away and he was going to burn it. And I was, you know, distraught, upset. So here I am, 40 years later, I'm at this retreat, this memory comes forward, it's like, what does this have to do with this thing with my boss? And then they asked us to, uh, she asked us to create, can we name the belief that got formed? And here's the way that came for me. I came to believe that if I show up as who I am, with all of my quirks, eccentricities, preferences, it hurts the people I love. And so at three years old, I began to build a mask, a shell, to edit what I showed to people about who I was so that the people I love would be safe. At three years old, I carried that much responsibility. And can you see? I was wrong. That wasn't true, ever. And at 43 years old, I had the chance to bring it to consciousness, recognize the fallacy of it, and release it, and stop doing that. I'm working on it. I make him out here with a doll next week. You don't know. <laughs> I will tell you, I told this story on a Wednesday night a couple of times over the years, and uh, uh, Marta Defex, one of my dear friends in our community, for my birthday year or the year two years ago, she gave me this beautiful fabric doll of Saint Michael the Angel, who is my archetype, with his little sword, and he sits on my altar at home, and sometimes I hold him when I meditate. <laughs> yeah.
I don't know what your lies are that you carry from childhood, but I know you have some. I know that there's some false belief about who you are and what you got to be, and I know that it's standing in the way of your true expression and the calling God has upon your life. I know this. I also know why your affirmations aren't working. Because unless you're willing to do the deeper work, we won't get to the depth of the false belief, and the depth of our teaching won't reach it. This is a deep teaching I'm offering you. I feel obligated to bring this to you today. Many modalities will work. For me, it was 12-step. It was new thought teaching, unity, science of mind. It was therapy. I'm through those things, and I'm still working on it. I want you to know that. As your minister, I feel obligated to continue to doing, to doing my work so that I can become more free to discover my wholeness and release those self-sabotaging behaviors and patterns. Lisa Firestone is a psychologist, and she wrote an article in uh, Psychology Today, which I found very, about self-sabotage, and I found it to be very revealing. These are four fundamental ways that we do self-sabotage. One is unworthiness, a fundamental belief that we are deficient, that we are not good enough to have the life of our dreams. Don't amen on this part, but I know you feel it. Yeah. Comfort. The critical inner voice likes to keep us in a box, pigeonholed by an identity assigned to us and not necessarily one we earned. It can be tricky and flood us with thoughts that are seemingly self-soothing. It is easier, after all, to recognize an internal enemy when it's yelling at you that you're stupid or a failure. It can be harder to identify it when it's whispering thoughts like, you're just fine on your own. Be by yourself. Have that extra slice of pie. Smoke one more cigarette. You deserve it. You're tired. Turn on the TV. Kick back. Don't worry about your goals today. That's self-sabotage through comfort. Rigidity. A negative self-image is unpleasant and destructive, but we often don't challenge it because it's what? Familiar. It's what we know. If you think about familiar also being family, mm-hmm, we start to make rules for ourselves and our lives based, upon, um, based on an old idea that we believe will protect us, but that will actually hurt us in the long run. And fourth, and perhaps the most universal, is fear. Fear is usually at the root of what holds us back. Fear of the unknown or unfamiliar, fear of failure, fear that our critical inner voice will be proven right or overpower us, fear that we will have too much to lose or that we will have to face pain or rejection. You see what we're up against. It's a lot. You got this. I know you do, because I know who you are. The light of God is bright in you. I want to say the force is strong with this one. So I, <laughs> it's true. And you're called to overcome these false limiting ideas so that you can give your gift to the world more freely. I know this as sure as I'm breathing. Jim Carrey, in the same article by Lisa Firestone, she quotes Jim Carrey in a a uh, commencement address he had. It went viral, you may have seen it, but he, in that he talked about his father. Oh, and I want to close the circle on that. My dad and I were great. <laughs> he passed away a year and a half ago, and he was my biggest champion. The, he supported all of me so much, and I found that doll hidden in the back drawer of his workbench when I was 15 years old. He never <laughs> burned it. <laughs> But Jim Carrey was talking about his dad, who was also a big supporter of him, and he said, you know, you can fail at anything. Why not fail at something you love? Why would we let fear keep us from bringing our gift to the world? Well, you got to come back next week. I'm going to tell you how to get rid of this stuff. <laughs> there are some practices. The main ones I want to focus on next week are... Um, denial and affirmation, based in unity truth, based in the teaching that God is alive in you, seeking to reveal its wholeness as your very life, and denying the truth of any of these beliefs 
any of these false beliefs in your life. And then the second, self-compassion. Thank you, Tricia. I got to, she invited me to uh, uh, hear Kristen Neff, a UT professor and author, speak on the power of self-compassion. We're going to be talking about those things next week. Because it's important. You can let yourself off the hook. It, well, yes and no. And <laughs> good news, bad news. You ready for this? <laughs> The good news is that a lot of the problems, really, you did nothing to create. I remember when I first um, got sober, they told me that it's like, it's a disease, Michael. You didn't, you're not bad because you, you're an alcoholic. It's just a disease. You're off the hook. But then the bad news is you're responsible for every choice, every word, every belief, every aspect of your life. You are responsible. And you're equipped. I want to leave you with a poem. But first, I want you to know that your ministers are not over this stuff yet. We are also doing our work on this. We struggle, too. We're in this together. What's that? Did you say speak? I like tacos. <laughs> G. Marie says, G. Marie says, I like tacos. <laughs> I thought she was going to say, no, I'm done. I got mine. No, no that's me. That can't. Karen is the enlightened one. She's the bodhisattva holding the door open for the rest of us. Thank you. <laughs> you know, we're all in this together. And we are not bad getting good. We're not sick getting well. We're not lost getting saved. We are whole. And we're revealing more and more and more and more of our wholeness. We are a masterpiece, just not finished yet. So I'll close with this. This is a, a poem. I, for years I was saying that these were uh, translations of Hafez, the, the, the Persian Sufi master, and one of our own members who comes from that tradition, who speaks Persian, corrected me recently, said these are actually more, they're more accurately described as new poems inspired by the ancient Persian writer. But this is Daniel Ladinsky on Hafez. And he says this, one day the sun admitted, I am just a shadow. I wish I could show you the infinite incandescence that has cast my brilliant image. I wish I could show you when you are lonely or in darkness, the astonishing light of your own being. You are amazing. Something is happening here. Thank you for being a part of it with me. I love you. God bless you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.